The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes with Plein Air and Fine Art Connoisseur Magazines, and I've always loved Rembrandt, and I wanted to see how Rembrandt actually accomplished his technique. Well, there's one guy who's a complete Rembrandt geek. He has studied everything possibly known about Rembrandt, studied his techniques, even grinds and makes his own paints. This guy's the real deal. His name is Eric Johnson, and this video is Rembrandt Secrets Revealed. Hello, my name is Eric Johnson. I'm an instructor at the Academy of Realist Art in Boston. In this video, we're going to be copying a Rembrandt at the age of 23. This Rembrandt was done in his early years when he was still a student in Leiden with his contemporary Jan Lievens. One of the things that you'll find about Rembrandt is he and all of his other Dutch contemporaries had a very systematic way of working, a very logical order of painting that ensures a success at the end of every work. So in this video, we're going to be completely going over each stage of Rembrandt's working process. That will include toning a canvas or an imprimatura, the umber layer, which is a flat wash, which will invent the drawing and solidify the composition. The dead color, which is building in pasto before any early layers or glazes. Following that, the bulk of the work is going to be done in a stage called working up, and that's where all of the magic really happens. In this video as well, we're going to be covering traditional materials that Rembrandt and his, and his contemporaries of the 17th century would have had and employed. But before we get on to any painting, let's cover some of those materials. Before you move on to do a Rembrandt or a master copy of your own, I think it's important that you watch this video from beginning to end. That way you can become familiar with each stage and understand it thoroughly before you go at it on your own. The reason being is, it can sometimes become a bit overwhelming. Now you'll notice that this video is broken up into many stages and Rembrandt worked in many stages. He worked by natural light, so the amount of time that he spent on a single picture was actually quite small. Of course, when he had larger commissions like the anatomy lesson of Nicholas Tulp, uh, the patrons would actually complain that they had to sit for too long. But for some of these self-portraits, and if you look at the mass volume of all of the work that Rembrandt did, he would actually work on multiple paintings in a single day. So our process that we're going to be doing is actually going to be very segmented, and it's going to be done over many layers. Now to reduce the amount of uh, frustration or getting lost, it's really important that you take each of those stages and understand the objectives of that stage and master that and get that as good as possible before jumping in moving on to the next one. Now every single one of these stages are going to be are going to need to be thoroughly dry before you paint on it the next day. Some of these stages may only take half an hour to an hour. Others may take more than that. So watch the video from beginning to end and watch each segment multiple times. That way you can understand it thoroughly. Okay, so let's cover brushes first. So Rembrandt would have primarily used 
hog bristle brushes and natural sable brushes. In the 17th century, there was no synthetic brushes like we have the luxury of using today. Over the course of this painting, we will utilize our, uh, our time and century and use some synthetic brushes, but that's fine because they do a very similar job. Although nothing can compare to the feel of natural brushes. So what we have are all round brushes. In the 17th century, there were no metal ferrules. So the ferrules that they had were actually goose feather ferrule or wire tied ferrule brushes. With that limitation, there were no options for flats, filberts, fan brushes, cat's tongues, and all of the other funky shapes. So everything that they did, they did with this limitation of only round brushes. So in this limitation, we have a variation of thickness and grit, how stiff the bristle is. So we have natural hog bristle here, which is most ideal for the earliest layers where we need to move paint around rather quickly. We have some that are still a little bit more stiff, uh, which will, we will use in the later stages as well. But for most of the delicate work, we're going to be using these soft synthetics and natural sable brushes. So these rounds are gonna come in two major forms. They're going to be short-haired and long-haired. A name for the long-haired brush, like you see here, are going to be riggers or script brushes. If you ever look at a Dürer or Rembrandt, a Rubens, any painting before the 19th century, you can see the calligraphy or mark making of these beautiful long-haired brushes. The other brush that we have are these, which are a blue squirrel hair. You can get these right at your local art store in the watercolor brush section, and that's totally fine. Watercolor brushes are just different hairs and they are softer, but we can absolutely use them for oil painting. And any artist will use any material in regards to brushes that does the job if the shoe fits, really. So next let's cover Rembrandt's oils. So Rembrandt primarily would have used two oils, linseed oil and walnut oil. So these are the main oils used to make paint. One thing you'll notice is that walnut oil will yellow significantly less than linseed oil. So Dutch painters at that time would actually mull and make paint that is a light value like lead white, yellow ochre, lead tin yellow, or even some of the more vibrant blues with, the, with this walnut oil to reduce the amount of yellowness that happens over the course of time. Those darker valued colors like ivory black, burnt umber, raw umber, and sometimes smalt or ultramarine, and we'll go over that in just a minute, uh, would be mulled with this linseed oil. So just to talk about the nature characteristics of these oils, walnut oil is going to dry slower than linseed oil. Walnut oil is going to dry with a softer paint film and it's going to yellow less. So the linseed oil is typically more amber in color and it has a higher acid content, which typically allows you to pack a little bit more pigment into the paint. So all of the paints that we're going to be using over the course of this video are going to be all handmade paint, which lack stabilizers, which uh, modern day paint manufacturers put in the paint to reduce the amount of separation that occurs. Because if you imagine uh, paint and pigment, it's really quite a simple thing. Oil, pigment, mix them together and you have paint. But when you need that paint to last in a tube for 
two years, gravity will take that pigment, which is heavier than the oil, and separate them. So because of that stabilizer, it, the paint takes on a different physical character, quality, that handmade paint uh, differs. The other oil that we're going to talk about is black oil, which is a partially oxidized and polymerized oil uh, made from the boiling of linseed oil with the, with the addition of a siccative. Now a siccative is a, it's a metallic catalyst which helps expedite the drying of our drying oil. So what, what they use for black oil is to boil the linseed oil and add a small amount of lead litharge or lead oxide. So let's go over the pigments and the paints that Rembrandt would have used. So here we have a, a variety of colors, but if we were to compare it to our 21st century variety, it's not that much of a variety at all. So we have lead white, and this is a stack lead white. So what stack lead white is, is it's a slow process of carbonizing sheet lead. What they would do is take, uh, take lead and hammer it out. And at that time, lead was a pretty common, commonly used metal for drinking vessels, plates, and et cetera. So lead was something that the, the Dutch were pretty familiar with. What they would do is they would hammer out that lead and they would make it into a coil. And they would take that coil and put it into an earthenware jar um, or a terracotta jar for, for the rest of us. And they would put vinegar in the bottom or wine that had spoiled. They would suspend that lead coil in that jar, cover it up, and then just surround it with horse manure. But never pig manure because uh, the manure from pigs has an excessive amount of sulfur in it because they'll eat just about anything. Uh, that excessive amount of sulfur will corrode the lead in a way that will darken it and make it dingy looking. So if you ever go to the art store and you look for lead white, you may stumble upon a, a different name like Kremnitz white or flake white. The reason it's called flake white is because that lead coil starts to rust this beautiful vibrant white pigment. And when that lead coil is completely corroded, the pigment is collected, ground up, washed, and then made into paint. The main difference between the lead white that we have in the 21st century and the lead white that Rembrandt had would be the particle size. So with lead, stack lead white, there's a variation in the particle size. And that gives a different fixotropic quality to the paint. So moving on, we have yellow ochre, which is simply yellow dirt, a, a hydrated iron oxide. Uh, sometimes you'll come across yellow ochre, and you'll see that it's referred to as bog iron. And like I said, it's a hydrated iron oxide. And if, we, if our assumption that the Earth's mantle is molten iron. It makes sense that there's a lot of iron oxide present in just the Earth, period. So as that iron comes to the surface and it gets exposed to our atmosphere, which is rich in oxygen, that iron oxidizes over many thousands and millions of years. So when that oxidiz oxidization takes place in the presence of water or a bog, like we said, it takes on this yellow color. Now this yellow color comes in many, many, many varieties. This specific ochre is actually from Morocco, although there are some of the finest mines in Cyprus off the coast of Greece and in France. So where exactly Rembrandt got his yellow ochre, we're not 100% sure, but uh, chemically speaking, they're just about the same. So moving on, we have Rembrandt's primary choice of red, 
and this is going to be a vermilion. The Dutch mastered the dry process of creating vermilion, which is a mercuric sulfide pigment. So one, one part mercury, one part sulfur. This red mineral called cinnabar, which was imported from Spain or from China, would then be heated to an extremely high temperature. And at that point, the sulfur would evaporate from it. And you would be left over with just a pool of quicksilver mercury. What they would then do is take that mercury and mix it together with sulfur, introduce that to a bit of heat, and put it in a, a crucible, and it will spontaneously combust and precipitate a beautiful red pigment. Moving on, we have raw and burnt umber. Now, raw and burnt umber are pretty much the same. The main difference is raw umber in its natural form is an iron oxide stained clay containing manganese. Now, that manganese helps give burnt umber its lovely, rich color. So when this raw umber is quite literally burnt or heated to an excessively high temperature, it takes on a warmer, richer, fiery orangish quality. And that's because the, uh, the pigment is calcined and it's dehydrated. So moving on to Rembrandt's primary choice of blues, we have smalt, genuine ultramarine, and black. And I will refer to black actually as a blue pigment because in the high majority of Rembrandt's paintings, he actually used black as if it were blue. So, a brief description of these colors. This is smalt, which is a cobalt-doped glass. So, they take cobalt ore and roast it with silica or sand. And once that is red hot and melted, they would pour that into a tub of water and it creates this really interesting, almost blue glass lava rock. This is actually quite light and is easy to grind up. So the grind would be relatively coarse, uh, which made it somewhat difficult to work with. Next to it is genuine ultramarine purified by Cennini's recipe. You can see there's a pretty stark difference in the intensity of the blue. So the ultramarine has a smaller particle size than the smalt, but if you were to take the smalt, and like I said, it's ground up relatively coarse, if you grind the smalt up a little bit too fine, it actually becomes colorless, and it becomes just see-through in an ashy color. So Rembrandt did not have the wealthy patrons that, say, Vermeer did, who wanted that vibrant, rich, ultramarine blue. So he would use smalt or a, I, or, sorry, not an iron, but a copper-based pigment called azurite for the blue moments in his paintings. But in the high majority of his portraits, he actually used black far more than any other blue pigment. So the blues in his paintings are actually quite minimal. So the black is primarily two forms. It is bone black or it is ivory black. So here I have two, two, those two varieties. This is bone black, which is simply a, a bone from a cattle that's put in an airtight crucible and thrown into a fire and left to sit there and roast for a handful of hours or overnight. Now, depriving the organic matter of the bone from oxygen, it carbonizes the bone into what we know as bone black. If you ever have a campfire, you'll notice that at the end of the night, the campfire is completely white with ash. Now that white ash usually snuffs out the bit of carbonic mass, which is charcoal, made from the wood because that white ash has snuffed out 
any oxygen from getting to it, that bit of wood carbonizes and it makes our natural variety of charcoal that's the same that we use for our charcoal drawings. You can do the exact same thing with any bone that has been boiled and the oils have been extracted from it. You can do that with bone or you can do that with ivory. And although I do not condone under any circumstances the, sel the senseless killing of majestic creatures like uh, elephants and rhinoceros, if there is a pump organ that's falling apart and it's free on Craigslist, don't mind if I do, I'll take all of those ivory keys off of it and make some genuine ivory black. So to me, that's just a good use of the material so it doesn't go to waste. So I find that making my own pigments just makes the, the act of painting so much more intimate than just going to the store and buying a, a tube of this or a tube of that. And I don't think that you need to do this at all, but I personally get a lot of enjoyment um, and pleasure from making my own pigments, grinding them up. That way there are varied particle size. So my paint can be the closest to the old master's paint. The thing that brought me to just the craft of painting and the love for painting was actually looking at Rembrandt's work. And I knew from a very early age that there's something different about Rembrandt's paint. There's something different about these old masters paint, not even just their paintings, but the quality of the paint was different. It was unique from anything that I had ever seen or anything that I had ever used. So that led me into this black hole of uh, digging for information and reading old treaties from the 15th, 16th, 17th, and 18th, 19th century to just figure out what was the perspective of these painters and why did they paint the way that they did. So you can see we, uh, this, is, this is the limitation where the high majority of paintings are worked up from. So if this is all you have, you have to do everything you can to expand the capabilities of this light limitation. Okay, so let's make paint. I've put on some gloves just to keep my hands out of the paint. This is for our safety or my safety in this instance. Uh, you, you want to respect the materials and respect the toxicity of the materials and the cleanliness of your clothes because it's going to be a lot easier to just take these gloves off than scrub the paint out of the uh, grooves in your fingernails. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be working with raw umber for this entire stage, the underpainting and the imprimatura. So what I'm going to do to start is I'm going to take a small amount of this raw umber and I'm going to put it down. Now remember what I was saying about uh, the strength of the, the drying in linseed oil and how artists would use linseed oil for the darker colors and walnut oil for the lighter ones. So what we're going to use is linseed oil for this. Now, when you make paint, you want to make sure that you have the cleanest oil possible. So if you'd like some information on cleaning the mucilage out of paint, I highly recommend you watch the Dan Graves video where he goes over cleaning the mucilage out of cold pressed linseed oil. For this, we have some linseed oil that's already been cleaned. So I tried to find the palest linseed oils possible. What we're going to do is we're just going to take an eyedropper. Since this is a small amount of paint, we need a small amount of oil. One of the things you'll notice about these earth colors is they're pretty thirsty. They, they want a lot of oil. Now when you buy store-bought paint, remember earlier I was talking about those stabilizers being in that paint. So, 
a lot of people have the uh, misconception that the store-bought paint is already very lean. But because of the stabilizers that are put into the paint, you'll realize that store-bought paint is actually more oily than the paint that we have when we make it without any stabilizer. Now, artists before the age of store-bought paint knew all of this information, not about the stabilizers because they weren't around yet, but they knew the qualities, the individual qualities of each pigment in each paint and how the particle size and the oil uh, would relatively dictate the characteristics. So what I'm going to do is I'm just taking, and you can see I didn't mix all of the, all of the pigment and oil at once. I mixed a small amount and that's going to stop uh, the paint from clumping up. I'm sure we've all made brownies at one time or another. And you know if you, if you make brownies and if you pour all of the oil in all at once instead of mixing in little by little, it creates these dense, dark, um, dense, hard blobs of relatively dry clumps. The exact same thing happens with this paint. So once I have a small amount made, um, if I were to add more paint to this, it's going to become too dense and it's going to get uh, unruly and hard to work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and I'm going to add a few more drops of oil to it. And I'm going to make this paint a little bit more oily. In preparation to add a little bit more pigment to it. Once we have the rest of this pigment incorporated into this body of paint, what we'll do is we'll take this molar and we will spread it out. That way we can get a nice thin uh, paint film. We get the oil to surround and cover each individual pigment particle. A palette knife just does not have the pressure and grit to allow you to do that. So this can be a laborious task. And usually, uh, this was not the job of the master artist, the head of the, uh, the studio or the workshop. This was the job of the apprentice. So when Rembrandt was studying with, say, Peter Lastman, he probably was the one who was making Peter Lastman's paint. So every artist would have, have to do this at some point or another. Whether they decided to continue to do it, it all depended on if they had a workshop and enough students, which Rembrandt uh, had almost too many students, which is one of the things that led him into debt and ended with him in bankruptcy, other than his extravagant spending on things. So you can see little by little the thickness of the paint keeps increasing. And I'll add little by little a few more drops of oil. One of the things that I do know, based on experience, is that you want to have the viscosity of the paint or the apparent viscosity of the paint thicker than you want before you mull it. So I don't want this to be as oily as I want in the end. I want this to actually appear a little bit stiffer while I'm working the pigment into the paint with the palette knife. So just make sure that you have all, all the dry pigment incorporated. And now you can see we have this very dry mass of paint that does a good job. It stands on its own. It doesn't uh, dissolve and just become this pooled mess that self-levels. It wants to stand up on its own just like you know from store-bought paint. So this pigment in particular, raw umber, burnt umber, a lot of the earth tones don't really require any stabilizer at all. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this molar and I'm going to start with the larger one first. I'm going to place that right on top of the paint. And I'm going to use one hand to push down and the other hand to just stabilize. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use small circular motions. And it starts out very resistant, but in even just a few moments, the paint gives way and it gets thinner or the viscosity gets thinner. It moves easier and easier. You can see I can do this with one hand now. So I'm putting a, a fair amount of pressure. With a larger molar, that pressure is over a larger space. With a smaller molar, you can press you can isolate that pressure under a smaller area and do smaller circled motions. So we can do figure eights, back, forth, up, down, or just small circles. It's just important that we get the entire body of paint. Now on this I have some paint that hasn't been mulled. The last thing that I want to do is pick all this paint up with this palette knife with unmulled paint on it. So what I'll do is I'll take bottom of the molar and take the paint off. And then I'll follow up with a rag or paper towel. Now, a brief talk about oils. We are painting with drying oils, and these are oxidizing oils. Our paint does not dry through evaporation, it dries through oxidization. So our paint quite literally takes in atmospheric oxygen and that allows it to dry. Another form of oxidization that you're probably very familiar with is a match lighting. That is an extremely fast form of oxidization. So what you need to do is make sure that you have good studio safety practices. So because these are oxidizing oils, you do run the risk of your oily rags spontaneously combusting. So it's very important that you get yourself an oily waste bin or you know, simply store your oily rags in an old pasta jar with a bit of water in it to which you then uh, dispose of properly not by throwing it out if you're th if you have toxic chemicals but looking uh, looking online and seeing when hazardous waste is picked up in your neighborhood or if there's a hazardous waste uh, dis uh, disposal location Sometimes they'll pick it up, sometimes you have to take it someplace, but we only get one in, we only get one uh, earth, so it's not the best idea to be putting lead and cadmium and arsenic and mercury in the environment. So you can see now the paint has a very nice consistency. It's not too thin and it's not too thick. So what we're going to do is we're just going to take a, a little break. I'm going to clean this up and then we're going to go over the imprimatura and toning the canvas. So let's move on to the imprimatura. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our, we're going to take our linen and we're going to start by degreasing our surface. So what I'll do is I'll take the, uh, the the best turpentine that I can find, and this is a single distilled gum spirits turpentine, not a rectified turpentine. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by just wiping the surface down. So one of the things that you'll notice is sometimes oil primed linen, like our own paintings, um, sometimes the surface, the surface energy from one layer to the next is so different that the oil paint beads up. 
So I like to, you know, gently sand or uh, wipe wipe the canvas down with uh, mineral spirits or turpentine just to abrade the surface a bit and allow it to take the tone well because this linen has probably been drying or uh, in a roll for years on end. So once we do this, it provides a nice relatively slick surface. What I can do is I can take Take that same rag and just dip it into the burnt umber, or raw, raw umber, sorry. And just wipe it around. For those of you who have never painted on an oil primed linen, I, I think that you will find that this stage especially is quite fun when you're, uh, when you're primarily used to an acrylic or universal primed uh, canvas or linen that is very absorbent. So what I'll do is just do this, and just wipe it, wipe it down. I, I don't want uh, this imprimatura itself to have uh, too much character. When I say character, I mean strong strokes, slashes through it. I want it to be relatively quiet, lacking high contrast in the marks that I'm making because I don't want those to uh, get in the way of my observations and my statements that I'm making later on. I I'll want this just a little bit darker and I can easily just take a small amount of this paint and you can see it'll spread around pretty easily. One of the things that I would probably discourage is the use of doing this imprimatur with excessive, excessive amounts of OMS, mineral spirits, Gamsol, they're all petroleum distillates or uh, turpentine. The best thing that you could use is lavender spike oil and that's because it's not going to damage the paint. These mineral spirits, these paint thinners, uh, have a bad relationship with oil and they actually damage the integrity, the strength of the oil. Because this is so thin, it's, it's not too much of an issue at all. So, uh, we're going to let this dry for about a week or so, and then we'll get into the painting. Now we're going to work on the umber layer of the underpainting. So this is where a lot of the inventing happens. So what we're going to be primarily doing is working out the largest proportions in the simplest way. So our main objective is to simply separate light from dark in a mass of uh, one dark mass and the light mass being the tone that we have for the linen that we did for the imprimatura. As you can see, I've made uh, the exact same paint that we had in the last section, just raw umber. So if, if you make this or if you buy a brand that is maybe a little bit too lean or too stiff and you want it to ha have a little bit more flow, I, I recommend adding a drop of linseed oil, but emphasis on a drop. Not much at all, because the last thing that you want is this beginning layer to be overly fat or overly oily, because that will make, that'll make your painting crack and it will uh, resist upcoming layers, and then you can have things like delam delamination or alligatoring um, in your later stages of paint. And that's the last thing that we want, of course. So I would, I would refrain from adding any mineral spirits or turpentine to this because this, this pigment itself is quite thirsty. And uh, thirsty, I mean thirsty for oil. So a drop of oil isn't going to hurt it at all. You always want to put oil into your body of paint, but never oil onto your surface and never oil or medium onto your small, thin mixtures. Always add it to the biggest body of paint as possible to minimize the ratio of oil to pigment. So the setup that we have is site size. There's two main ways that we can copy reality, whether that be from a photograph, a painting, or directly from life. We can do things either sight size, which is a one-to-one -one ratio. So the size of this printout is going to be the size of our painting. The other way is comparative. So say we were only working from the iPad, which we will use later to assess the 
closer uh, detail work of the texture or a, a little bit more of a sophisticated view of the coloration that happens. So if we were copying, copying from a smaller or larger image, making things smaller than we see or making things larger, that would be considered comparative measurement. So we would be sizing things up or sizing them down and translating the proportions according. For this, I think the, the easiest way, especially for uh, beginning students, is to study and work sight size. That way the size of our painting is the size that we can see. And with our eyes, we can flick our, flick our eyes back and forth in the same general area. And that's going to allow you to uh, see when things are too large or too small or too angled, too upright, too horizontal. So we only have this raw umber. We have uh, bristle brushes as our primary choice of brush. For some of the smaller uh, refinement, say the corner of the mouth, the nose, or um, the ear in the corner of the eye, we can use a smaller, softer haired brush, and that will just uh, help our painting not get too ragged and generically soft. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with this round. This is a round number 10. Um, the number of brushes don't really matter because this is a round number eight. Obviously, this is an eight, this is a 10, and this one is larger and this one is smaller. So uh, I think it's best to just look at the size of the brush and, and, and judge according. So what we're going to do is we're gonna start. Now, do you see this, this wooden palette? I prefer to paint on a wooden palette. You can see close to the paint, it'll, it'll drag, but over here, it's like I can't make a mark. So every day before I start working, what I want to do is oil out my palette. So I'll take the same linseed oil that I made the raw umber with, and I'll put a few drops right on the palette. Now, the, the wood is slightly absorbent, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to oil out the high majority of this palette. As you can see here, the paint takes, but then it quickly dries out. I'm going to leave a small section over here that's not oiled out, just in case I want to dry out the paint a small amount. I can also do that onto uh, a rag or paper towel. But I want to make sure that this is a nice slick surface to paint on, to mix my paint on. You don't, well, you want to make sure that this layer of oil is also quite thin. So doing that, and I'll just, you know, just like we mold the paint, just small circular motions. It's really important that you don't add too much oil to your palette because then your paint becomes over oily. We'll be oiling out the palette uh, every day before we work. So now when we take our paint, we can see we can make marks and the paint will flow. What I have prepared is a handful of rags and that's going to allow me to erase areas where the paint should not be. So the lightest values are going to be the tone of the linen. I'm going to aim to not darken into what is going to be the background of our painting as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by mapping out the largest proportions that I can see. So I'm going to take a small amount of paint. I don't want to grab paint from the top. I always want to grab it from the side. That way I can keep a very controlled amount of paint on my brush at all times. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with uh, the top of the head. I'm going to come over and as I can see, it, if I were to look at the, uh, the bottom here, there's a small space here and there is a small space here. So I think I'll start with those because those are some things that I can get at least wrong. So what I'll do is I'll to start just with relatively straight lines. draw out the arabesque 
of the portrait. You know, I'll, I'll aim to build this up as a unit as much as possible. Meaning, I don't want to obsess on working one small area for too long. I want to build this up as, large, as, as broadly as possible. So one, one of the things that I'm finding is my paint is seeming a little too dry. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add just a few drops. to my paint. And I'm just going to mix that up with the palette knife. So now what I'll do is I'll test. And as you can see, it's a lot easier to spread this paint around and make marks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one of the uh, bristle brushes that we have, and I'm going to load it up pretty well. Uh, for all of this, I just want this to be one large dark shape. So I'm just going to start by doing that. I question, what can I do and get least wrong? I know that this is all going to be simplified as one dark shape. So I, I don't want to jump into doing the corner of the eye just yet. Because one of the things I do know is this whole bottom area needs to have raw umber on it. And I can start in an area that I feel most confident. You know, I'm not going to start right on the edge. I'll actually work out to that. You can see I'm stretching this paint as thin as possible. So I, I really want this, this layer to be thin, meaning I want the amount of paint to be on there to be as little as possible. I, I, I look at how, how this space looks right, right to the edge. I just make sure that I don't make that come happen way up here, way down there. And then there's this really small shape right here that I can work for. Now when Rembrandt did this, obviously he was looking through a mirror. So uh, these are some luxuries that we have because we are copying from the flat. So we can use our, our academic tools or uh, tools that we learn in um, any type of academic setting or training. So what we could do is we could take something like the height of the head from the top to the bottom of the chin and make sure that that is correct. So if the top of my head is here and the bottom of my chin is here, I could, I could take this needle, close my less dominant eye and just make a, a mark for that. You know, I want this, I want this mass to be as, as flat as possible. So I, I don't want to go in and start having darker and lighter moments. I, I really just want it to be simple. That's the main objective right now is to, uh, to simply establish the drawing, establish the composition, and work the largest proportions first. So I, I, can, I can jump around a small amount, but I want to refrain from jumping around too much. But the next thing that I know is this, this whole side of the face is primarily in shadow. We have that nice Rembrandt lighting, this little triangle of light that illuminates the other cheek. But what I do know is there's a, there's a relatively small amount of space here. This has probably gone out too far, can probably come in just a bit. But I, I do know that there needs to be some tone, some umber here as well. So I'll just put that in to start with. You know, same thing up here. You know, the, the hair gets very close to the value of the background, which I see and understand, but I, I think it's going to be best if we don't lose the edge here too much just yet. Uh, there will come a time when we do push the value so close in relationship to each other that it becomes hard to distinguish where the hair ends and the background begins. And that's going to give a nice atmosphere to our painting. So I'll do the same thing over here. You notice I haven't even really put much information in for the face at all yet, and that's it's because it's, it's all surrounded by this dark information, so 
Now, why, why put it in yet when we don't even have the large shape correct? So I'm, I'm, most, I'm most concerned about the largest possible shape that I have. So I'm just going to s simplify this and just make this all a dark shape. We do have this little triangle of light that illuminates the other cheek, but what we can do is take a rag and pull that out with our clean rag. And that's going to be a lot easier than trying to uh, work around it. That way we can work with the largest possible shape as we can. So I think we'll, I think we'll simplify these things together. Even here in the, uh, underneath the chin. Now let's just get it covered. Now, one of Rembrandt's most prominent pupils, Hoog Stratton, uh, wrote a treaty where he described the objectives of these earliest stages and how, how broad and how simple they were. And it makes a lot of sense because uh, if, you, if you look at some of the unfinished Rembrandts that we have the luxury of being able to indulge in, it, you'll see that uh, sometimes there's the composition that's completely changed. And keeping this simple just allows us to have the freedom to change and move things around freely. You can see I didn't start right on the edge, I just I started about from the middle and I can start to work out. What I'll do is I'll just run over this at a consistent angle just to simplify and bring it together. So now what I can do is I can take my rag. Now if your rag gets too dirty, one of the things you can do, I like to roll my, my rag into, uh, you know, I just keep folding it, that way I can keep going to a clean spot. If, it's, if the paint is a little bit too dry, one of the things you can do is just take a small amount of oil and dip the corner of the rag in a small amount of oil, not too much though. And what that's going to do is it's going to, going to allow us to clean up that edge a lot more thoroughly. One of the things I'm going to do now is I'm just going to it just try and solidify things. I may move to uh, I may move to a smaller brush has a little bit more uh, accuracy to it because this this is great for uh, for scumbling and getting the broad areas. But if I try and go in, it's it's not going to make a a nice line. Not that we want to keep this overly linear, but we do want to have a, a higher amount of accuracy once we get into the features. So I think it's very important that from time to time you take a moment and you actually step back. Because when you are so close to your subject, your printout, it's going to seem distorted when you're trying to take observations back and forth. So I'd say a handful of times um, uh, throughout your working day, maybe every five minutes or so, to just step back and flick your eyes back and forth to judge the proportional relationships. So I can use a very similar motion with this brush as I did with the other one. But when I need to uh, make a mark, it's just going to give me less of a ragged edge. So if you come to any point where you feel like you start to get into the features, and it seems a bit overwhelming and you're struggling to get them correct. I, if I were you, what I would do is I would come to an area, say, uh, the side of the hair here, and you state that as uh, the relative side of the head. And what you can do is you can take that needle like we were talking before and take a measurement from the side of the head to the side of the nose, closing your less dominant eye and keeping your eye, your most dominant eye, fixed over your finger and just come over. And once you do that, you could see that the nose could come in quite a bit based on that observation. And that can stop you from uh, laboring over the shape or the design of the nose when it's in the wrong place. 
you can do the exact same thing. Say this is the bottom of the chin for the top of the forehead. So if this is the bottom of the chin, the top of the forehead would be there. It's okay if things get a little broken because we can always come back and clean them up with our rag. You know, even the ear here, let's let's just let's just put this all in shadow. No need to save it yet. So we'll just go for the light shape versus the shadow shape. I think one of the hardest things is getting over the, the awkward look of starting a picture. Sometimes it feels uh, like you come to this stage and there's no hope <laughs> because things take on such an awkward appearance. But I think it's really important that you, you trust yourself and trust your ability to draw and use whatever tools necessary to correct that drawing. And not get overly hung up on this looking perfect right away. Now with this we can just bring this in. Because I see there's this kind of rectangular shape. You know, we, we just really want the big look at this point. Just separate light from dark. You know, this I can even just make that a little bit larger, blow that out a bit, and then come back and clean it up. You know, I, I, I think the drawing of the mouth, the drawing of the nose and the eye are sometimes particularly difficult, especially when you're lining them up to each other. So one of the things that I would highly recommend is getting uh, getting at least one of them secure and accurate in your in the drafting stage of your painting. That way you can base other relationships off of them. So for for example, what we can do is go to the go to the side of the head or the side of the hair here and just judge where that corner of the mouth is going to be. We could do the exact same thing for, let's say, the corner of the eye here. You can see the corner of the eye would actually move over. Because if you look at this shape, you see there's almost like a stair. It comes up, down, over, down. We only have it going down. So it makes sense that this part of the eye can move over. Now, as you start to work on this, if, you're, if your imprimatura hasn't been drying long enough, this tone will start to come off really easily and very quickly. So uh, that's why it's important to let it dry. But if the imprimatura starts to uh, come off a bit, it's okay. It's not the end of the world by any means. So when I look at the ear and I, and I look at a horizontal alignment, uh, the shadow of the ear is almost perfectly in horizontal alignment with the bottom of the nose, so I can tell that this is going to have to move up. Because we also need more space between the bottom of the ear and the collar. So let's go ahead and just get this filled in a little bit more. If we uh, take a little bit too much for space from the collar, what we can do is we can always just come back out and pull it out. So I think it's going to be very important for you to just really take your time in this first initial stage. You definitely can get these proportions correct. You just need to spend time with them and not, ex not jump into the painting with the assumption that, you're, that you need to make it per perfect with every single mark. You can see this, this shape is you know, much more similar to the copy 
than here. So let's just use that to our benefit and just spend a little bit more time getting this area a touch more refined to educate us on the face, you know, as we start to move these proportions around. And I'm really trying to look at the height of this in relationship to each other and match that. And then match the angle in which it descends. Now, once again, I don't, I don't want any information here for uh, the armor. Just no need. If I wanted to, say, pull out a little bit for the highlight, sure, but also not 100% not necessary. So remember we were talking about the ear being in relationship or in alignment with the nose, and we can just bring that up. Once you have things relatively established, it becomes a lot easier to jump in and start to really refine drawing. And by drawing, I mean proportion and shape. We have the eyebrow and it comes relatively close to the edge of the side of the head. Now, if we look at the mouth, we can see that the mouth, the light shape extends further than the shadow right below it. And right now we have them on par with each other. So that's a great opportunity for us to bring this shadow in. And once again, if we, if we go a little bit further, we can always come back with our rag. wipe away. Okay, so I'm just trying to clean things up. You can see the, the painting starts out almost in a mist or a fog, and little by little the shapes become more and more refined. So I'll use the rag equally as much as I use the, the brush, just to push in and out. And it's really important that you just, you know, once again, take your time with this drawing, with just working the shapes. You can see we haven't even shown the separation of the hair to the side of the head. We're just treating this all as one large shape. So once we have uh, once we have our shapes a little bit more crisp, what we can do is we can start to go in and start to refine, start to take a little bit more of definitive measures. So uh, I'm going to take and go from the bottom of the chin, or the bottom that we have established here, and look at the top of the brow. And that's not too bad. He's, his brow looks a little bit more sad, and this shape looks a little bit tall. So it makes a lot of sense that we can take this and push it up a small amount. So the next thing that I'll do is check where the bottom of the nose is in relationship to the exact same point with the bottom of the chin. And I'll go to the bottom of, or the top of this, top of this light or the bottom of the shadow. You know, that's, that's looking pretty good. I'll do the same thing for the, uh, the crease in between the top lip and bottom lip. And that's not looking too bad either. What is, what is a little bit awkward is how, how generic I have the lip. So it's going to be important for us to get in there 
and really look at the specificity of those shapes and articulate them as such. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have another rag. Now sometimes the rag can be uh, a little too gawky as well. One of the other things that you can use is a makeup sponge. You can get these right at CVS or you can order them online. It's important that you get one that does not have uh, vitamin E infused in it because vitamin E is a non-drying oil and the last thing that we want is our paintings to not dry. But these will really thoroughly remove paint. So remember we took the top of the brow. Let's look at the bottom of the shadow of the eye and see how that is placed. So I can come down just a little bit more. You know, there's this light shape right below the brow and above uh, the top lid. We just want to make sure that there's enough space in there. You know, Rembrandt's eyebrow, eyebrow is, it travels uphill and it descends downhill right about here. And I think our, our descension point is a little bit too far to the right. So what I'll do is I'll let it travel uphill a little bit more to accommodate the size for this shape that we were lacking. Now the value relationship, um, the contrast between the light of the forehead and uh, the light here is very similar to the light of the brow here in relationship or in contrast to this. So I don't want to jump in there and make it extremely dense and heavy and dark. So I'll keep things relatively soft. You see we quickly open up that space. There's also the lid that we're missing. So what I'll do is I'll put a little bit more tone and I may actually come in with the uh, makeup sponge. will allow me to get in there with a little bit more dexterity. Then the next thing that I want to do is start to clean up this mouth. And I think the makeup sponge is going to be really useful for this, so I'll use it on its corner just to pull the paint away a little bit more. We can follow that up with, with our rag just to thin out that lip. At this point, I, I really just want to get back, take take a step back to the point that is two to three times the distance of the height of my painting. That way I can see it without any visual distortion. Oh, and I may paint with, a, uh, with my arm extended out further instead of standing so close to the painting for too long. So it's really important that you're conscious of the visual distortion that happens when you stand too close to your painting. So what I'm doing is I'm just taking, taking my time. You know, since I have such large and simple shapes, I can really focus on just the drawing, just the shapes. And you see, I, I, I rarely have to go back for more paint because there's plenty of paint on my surface. So I, I may make, a, there's this really rich dark moment there, and I, I may make that a touch darker just so we can start to see the overall proportion of his head as we get, as we get our shapes a little bit more refined. And, and I would say the same thing about the side, side of his head. Still keep things relatively soft. So what I'll do now is there's a change in, change in direction, change in form from the bridge of the nose to the ball of the nose, and R seems to be too similar. So what I'll do is I'll try and pull out the ball of the nose slightly to the right, because we can say that the side of the nose here 
is further to the right than this light or this light in a horizontal alignment. And right now it's seeming like this and this are pushing close to a horizontal alignment. So what I'll probably want to do is push this in and push this out just to work on the likeness and how these features align with each other. So it's going to be very important that you just once again take your time in this stage. And if we were to judge the painting too harshly a few minutes before, you know, we, we, could, we could very easily uh, fall into the trap of letting anxiety fuel our decision making. We want everything to have a simple and logical order. So there's two main, two main ways that you can hold your brush and for a variety of reasons. You can hold your brush similarly as you would hold a, a writing tool or a drawing tool just farther back or you can hold it overhand as if you were riding a bike. Now when you hold your paintbrush like this, you only have so much freedom to make any stroke from left to right. When you hold your paintbrush overhand like this, and if you move your uh, physical position, you can make a brush stroke in almost 360 degrees. So it's perfectly fine for you to change the position that you are holding your brush. And I'm really trying to best surmise this information. I'm not trying to decorate it too much with unnecessary detail. It's really just working on getting the likeness correct. And that likeness is going to come from these largest proportions and how they relate to each other. One of the things I notice is this angle is not as vertical as I have. It tips more, and this is not as squared off like a right angle. So I'll come in once again with the rag, and I'll pull it up and away. So when you are rendering form, when you are creating the illusion of form on a two-dimensional surface, a flat surface, it's going to be very important that you follow by a, uh, a few set of design principles. One of them being your exterior contour must always be convex. The exterior contour must never be concave. It must be convex and bulge out into our space. While the terminator line, where the shadow ends and the light begins, uh, should be relatively concave in relationship to the convex nature of the exterior contour. Uh, that nature alone will give your work much, much more of a believable sense of volume. If you like, you know, especially Da Vinci and Michelangelo, and if you look at their drawings, if you look at their paintings, their exterior contours are almost you know, exaggerated, well they are exaggerated, um, exaggeratedly convex, forms meeting forms meeting forms. The end of one form is simply the beginning of another. At, at this point we really want to just really get down and uh, really start to correct the drawing. Now that we have 
shapes much more solidified. We need to just get in there and correct them. So one of the things that I notice uh, right away is just this angle seems to be uh, too much tipping to the right. And I may just you know, add a little bit of information for this curl of hair. And just shrink this proportion just a bit. The, the ear, I think, can still move up to just give us a little bit more space. And we're just going to keep this as, as simple as possible. So we just want to get the relationships of these features correct. How they align with each other on vertical and horizontal alignments. So we have this nice change in direction here where the, uh, the shadow of his uh, chin or his jaw casts a shadow onto his neck, but because his collar is more forward in space, we get this nice uh, overlap that happens here, and I think it's going to be great for us to show that even at this stage. I just want to work, make sure that the, the height from the bottom of the chin to the top of the uh, collar is correct. There's enough of an angle difference. We're just going to keep that eye pretty simple for now. I think as your as your drawing gets more and more tight or refined, it's going to be even more important for you to take a step back more and more. It's very, very difficult to correct the drawing when you're not stepping back at all. So things are starting to get a little bit uh, unruly and a uh, bit high contrast overall. And at, at this point, I may take a, a small, br a, a soft brush and just run over things just to group them together again. We, there's, there's something to be said about keeping these shapes as broad and as free from contrast and uh, unnecessary contrast. So it's going to allow our observation to just see how the light shape um, silhouettes against that shadow as we start to perfect this arabesque of Rembrandt. You see, as we do this, it actually lightens the value, which isn't a bad thing at all. We want this layer to be as, as thin as possible. We don't want to commit to any brush strokes at this stage at all. We also want to make sure that our edges are relatively soft. Our Rembrandt's smiling a bit too much, so let's bring that down. So what I'm going to do now, now that things have gotten tighter, I'm going to use a mall stick. Uh, the virtue of the mall stick is primarily to keep my hands out of my painting. So what I'll do is I'll put this here just to stabilize my hand so I can get in there without having to put my fist or my pinky into wet paint. Um, and it just stabilizes my hand so I can make a more refined adjustment. This can be a removal mark or uh, applying paint. I'll use the mall stick more and more uh, as time goes on. So I just want to be conscious about getting my hand into my painting. So I've, I've picked up a smaller brush and that's just allowing me to get in here and tighten up these edges. Just move with a little bit more of a thoughtful hand. I'd really like to get into the eye and address the drawing of the lid. 
So we can take a another brush that is that is clean one that has relatively springy bristles that can be a synthetic or a hog bristle and we can actually shimmy our brush back and forth to push the umber back to correct drawing we can use that as opposed as opposed to using the rag or the sponge. You can see I can just push these around and it'll create a nice, relatively soft edge. I think this area I think would definitely benefit some, from some of that treatment. But it's not going to remove it all together, so when you do need to get in there and really remove something, go in with the sponge or the rag. But if it's a very slight push, you can take that other brush and push it back or forth. So I'll even come into uh, the ear and just work the shape as it comes down and over. Now I'm just going to lose the shadow shape. You can see there's a slight, uh, a small shadow shape right below the ear and I'm just going to lose that into the body of tone that we have here. We'll definitely find that again later. If in your copy you'd like to put that in earlier, that is totally fine as well. I'll, I personally like to leave my drawing as, as loose and open as possible. But when you're working on your own, own painting, your own master copy, or whatever it may be, you know, you definitely have the choice to add as much or as little as you deem necessary. Although I will say, when in doubt, less is more. So my goal, my goal for this is really, like, like I said before, to get those largest shapes established, but not to get every last plane change in, in and out. This moment here seems a bit too concave. So what I'll do is I'll use the mall stick just to steady my hand and I will pull the paint from the shadow into the light. So right now I, I feel like there's plenty enough paint actually on our surface. So it can become very uh, easy to have too much paint on the painting at this stage and you really want to limit the amount that you put on. You want the information to be as minimal, as uh, essential as possible, the essential minimal amount of information. And you really want your edges with your handling of paint to be soft, uh, not generically soft, but not a hard edge, say like this. You know, that level of sharpness in edge is something that you want to avoid at all costs. Because paint is relatively transparent, and because of that transparency, if you have too hard of an edge too early, it can be difficult to move that if it is in the wrong place. So there's a couple of ways you can achieve a hard or soft edge. One of them is by quite literally placing that um, in your application being hard-edged. The other is value contrast. So putting something very dark next to something very light will have the appearance of a hard, harder edge. That'll come, uh, that'll come into play a little bit later where we'll be dealing with uh, an you know, expanded variety of colors and adding information. So what I'll do is I'll start to suggest at the side of the side of the face. You've noticed I've done this a few times already and that's totally fine. As, as things get more definitive I can only state it better and better as time goes on.
but I'm not afraid of losing information at all. So you can see that I'm, I'm just jumping around a bit, going to the exterior contour of my shadows. You know, and right away, there's, you know, a much more crisp appearance to that arabesque, that division of shadow and light. When I come to certain things like the design of the nostril, I can see that my shadow shape here is a bit too tall, and it's making his nose look a little bit bigger than it rightfully should be. So what I'll do is I'll put use my mall stick and I'll take this brush and I'll do like I did before and just go back and forth and try to migrate some of that paint down. Now it's gonna leave a faint tone behind and I'll clean that up with a rag following that. At this, at this point I'm, I'm feeling better uh, about the uh, the pro the proportion of the features, so I think what I'll do is pull out this bit of light here with my rag. So my first observation is to look at how thin the shadow is to the right of the nose. I don't want to start off by removing shadow and making uh, making this proportion of that shadow too large. So I'm going to try to get that as correct as possible the first time. Now that I have the context to be able to do that. And I look at how far down it goes and it goes down slightly below where the shadow ends here for the nose. So I know that I can go slightly below that. Well, once again, I want to leave this, this edge, this shape, uh, still relatively soft. And we have the lid there. I'll, I'll, I'll follow up with soft brush just to solidify the information, just bring it together as much as possible. That way I can give a little bit more of a definitive shape to this light shape that I just pulled out. I'll do the same thing. You can see it does a great job of slightly lightening those shadows. I don't want to overly commit to too dense or dark of a value too soon. We have time to build these things up. You know, the other note, observation I take is just how thin this shape is. And mine looks a bit too thick. And this edge looks a little bit hard like we were talking before. So I can thin it out from both sides. Based on the relationship, this happens right at the peak of this form, and this happens close to the edge, but not in vertical alignment with the edge of the shadow shape for the nose. So that's the observation that leads me to push it in from two directions. I'll just take this and do that softening once again. Now I'm going to go back to the mouth and just correct the top contour because the amount of space between the bottom of the nostril here, here and the top contour of the top lip they seem a little bit close together at the moment, meaning this space looks a little bit small or short. So what I want to do is correct that by solidifying the drawing of the nostril. 
there's a plane change that angles upwards. And then there can be a little bit more dip into the bottom lip, or the top lip, sorry. But I want to keep this as, still want to keep this as simple as possible. I just want to make sure that these larger shapes have enough room to accommodate more information. Now, now what I want to start to work on is the shadow cast from the jaw. There are two types of shadows in this case. There are the form shadow, which right here, when the planar orientation of the, uh, of the jaw turns far enough away from the light that it becomes shadow. And then that change in plane casts a shadow onto the neck. So this is going to be the form shadow and this is going to be the cast shadow. Following this, I, I really wanna spend a little bit more time on the collar and just make sure that the foundation that I have is appropriate. Uh, for the additional information to come. So I may make this a little bit more broad. I'm going to keep the, the boundary between shadow and light a little bit more soft than it appears on Rembrandt as well. Just because this is, this is just the umber layer, we just want the big proportion of it, the big shape of it. So one of the things that I want to avoid is the collar has this appearance of tassels almost. I don't want to try and draw all of those at this stage at all. Right now my lips look a little bit long, the distance from here to here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to judge the relationship of the nose, the shadow that it casts onto the uh, upper lip. Just make sure that both of these are correctly placed. Because if I look at the distance between the end of the lip and the end of the neck, that seems like it is, um, you know, possibly even too short. The last thing that I want to do is uh, mess up any good proportion that I have. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to push some of these things to the left and I'm going to bring the corner of the lip and bring it to the right to minimize the amount because I don't want to bring this in and then make this distance too long. I can just go in with that smaller brush. Just correct the shape. The shadow that gets cast from the ear also seems like it's a bit too angular. And I'll just make that a little bit less eventful. When I say less eventful, what I really mean is decrease the amount of strong contrast between the angular relationships. There's this, uh, there's this, this plane right here that gets a little bit darker, and I think I'm going to leave that out. I'm going to wait till I have um, a little bit more, uh, a little bit more paint to describe that. I don't want to make that too dark too soon, so I'm just going to leave that out. I'm going to end the uh, the lips in a in a simpler manner. So the shadow on the neck also needs to be a bit more concave. So we can just come in here, pull a little bit out, just to increase the space. Then just come back with our soft brush. Just to show that change in form. So I'm going to go back to the eye. And I'm just going to uh, really start to prepare for tomorrow. Remember that you're always painting for tomorrow, not painting for today. Everything that you do today prepares 
the surface prepares every shape and value for the next application. So I don't want to get caught up in too thoroughly describing things at the moment. I just want to make sure that those biggest proportions are addressed. And right now it seems like we're coming to that point. What I, what I want to do is make any last corrections, soften any edges, and make sure that there's not any excessive buildup of paint in my shadows or on the edges. You definitely want to avoid ridges, points where the paint stands up and protrudes from the surface. And that's going to be relatively easy to do since we are working on such a fine linen. So as I soften things, I also want to make them a little bit lighter. You'll notice in a lot of Rembrandts, there's a, there's a similar objective, but how it's gone about is slightly dependent on the complexity of the situation. Right now, this gives us, you know, what I find is the easiest way to work. We're being as direct as possible in placing the proportions and changing the angles as much as possible. If we had uh, tons of paint already smeared on here, it'd be very easy for it to become generic and um, just not instructive enough. So instead, what we'll, what we'll do is we'll do that wipeout following this to actually bring those values down and separate some of the, uh, the lighter and darker moments in the shadow, as well as correct the shadow shapes even further. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll slightly darken where the iris would be. just in preparation because I may uh, make other things lighter. You can see just by shaking your brush back and forth, you can easily make a change in value in that shadow shape. Considered one of the greatest artists in history, 
and known for his lifelike and expressive portraits. Rembrandt created mood with dramatic light, thick paint and thin glazes. This year, the world is celebrating the Year of Rembrandt, marking the 350th anniversary of this great master's death. And yet, artists around the world are still studying his work to inform their own, trying to understand his techniques to give life and drama to their own paintings. Countless numbers of artists, whether students or professionals, have copied Rembrandt's work in order to better understand how and why his work is so historically significant. Yet few ever really figured it out because of his unique layering approach, which made him the master's master. In honor of the year of Rembrandt, and because so many artists want to understand Rembrandt more, in conjunction with Fine Art Connoisseur magazine, we began a worldwide search to find the one artist most capable of understanding and teaching Rembrandt's work at the highest level. That extensive search of the world's best Rembrandt copyists led us to an artist who has not only mastered the art of creating Rembrandt-style paintings in his own work, he has scoured ancient texts in foreign languages in order to understand every small detail. From how Rembrandt created his paint, how he prepared his canvas, how he layered paint, even how he used a simple technique to rough in the first layer without requiring a lot of drawing skill. Our search led us to a young artist who has spent the last decade obsessing about Rembrandt. And once you see him paint or listen to him talk, you'll instantly understand why we chose him over hundreds of other artists to be your teacher. One of the things that you'll find about Rembrandt is he and all of his other Dutch contemporaries had a very systematic way of working. A very logical order of painting that ensures a success at the end of every work. In Rembrandt's Secrets Revealed, artist Eric Johnson is going to show you everything that Rembrandt did that, without knowing it, would make him a timeless legend. You're going to see it all as Eric demonstrates a complete start-to-finish Rembrandt painting titled Self-Portrait at Age 23. And if you compare the original side-by-side, -side, it's amazingly accurate. You can observe and practice each and every step so you can create your own Rembrandt paintings. Also, you can give your paintings drama by employing Rembrandt's techniques. Seven full hours of detailed instruction that is easily understood by beginners and pros alike. All throughout the film, Eric includes information on the paint and materials used during Rembrandt's time period and suggests modern alternatives. You'll also hear many historical painting facts and tips that will help deepen and enrich your knowledge. You'll treasure this video because of the knowledge and skills you'll develop to increase your significance as an artist. Available on DVD or digitally to view on your computer, tablet or smartphone. In celebration of the official year of Rembrandt. Rembrandt Secrets Revealed with Eric Johnson. Order yours today. That was Rembrandt Secrets Revealed with Eric Johnson. If you want to learn more about that, just visit lilyartvideo.com. Now let's get into his head, learn a little bit more about his obsession with Rembrandt. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air Magazine, and welcome to Interviews with the Artists. Today we have a very special guest. We have Eric Johnson. Eric is a specialist in painting Rembrandt. And we're going to learn the story about how he has spent most of his adult life tracing Rembrandt, finding rare formulas, finding the way he created his paintings and studying them in depth, and then learning the process of painting Rembrandt. So Eric, welcome. Hey Eric, it's nice, nice to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm glad you're here. You know, I've learned more about Rembrandt in this week that you've been with me than I probably have my entire art career. Tell me about where this drive, this interest in Rembrandt came from. So when I was, when I was in high school, I, I loved Art and I and I always drew a lot when, as I was a child and I had this I had this high school art teacher by the name of Paul Bay, 
And I, at the time, I was thinking I was going to get into graphic design or something or other. And he looked at me and he said, I know that you have an interest in painting too. Do you know who Rembrandt is? And not coming from a, a very cultured background. You said you thought it was toothpaste. <laughs> 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 I had no idea who Rembrandt was. Right. And he showed me, uh, he sh we pulled up uh, a couple of images of Rembrandt and I just, my jaw dropped and I said, wow. I had no idea painting could be so ambitious and poetic and just, just undescribably uh, sophisticated. Just looking, uh, typically what I thought of painting was this, uh, a smooth application of paint. I, at the time, didn't think that before the 19th century and the Impressionists, I, I didn't think that artists made such thick textured work and I was just in love. Uh, later, he, he and I actually went to the local museum and I saw my very first Rembrandt and uh, as, you, as we all know, a photo does a Rembrandt no justice from seeing That's it right. in person, and it was a uh, it was a uh, a self portrait of his at the age of I believe forty five. Don't quote me on that, not exact. But um, following that, I uh, I graduated high school and I I decided that I just want to take a moment to paint, and I did I did my early adolescent Rembrandt copies, which none of you will ever see because they're <laughs> terribly embarrassing. <laughs> they're very, very bad. Uh, later on, I, I was actually awarded a scholarship to study at the Academy of Real Estate in Boston. And that was when I started the beginning of my classical education. And uh, through learning um, uh, French neoclassical traditions, it gave me more power in drawing, so I was more proficient with dealing with things like uh, proportion, shape, value, color, ha just getting comfortable using paint in a very traditional and controlled setting. Right. Um, after my first year, I completed the entire drawing program after, after one year. Uh, I was, uh, I was um, they asked me if I wanted to be an assistant instructor, and of course I accepted because I, I feel this obligation to keep our craft of painting just alive and that um, we take the breadcrumbs left by the old masters and pass them on to the generations. We, the artists of today, have an obligation to help the artists of tomorrow. And I think that's a really important thing to talk about just briefly because uh, all of that was almost lost. And mm -hmm. when we talk about the secrets of Rembrandt, the, you know, they had this system at the time, uh, essentially what we would call an atelier system, mm -hmm. where there was an instructor, an atelier would have been the studio of the, the instructor, who had some apprentices and maybe some students, pro not very many, probably two or three or four. Yeah. And then they would teach them everything they would know over a three or four or five year period of time and then continue to stay in touch with them throughout mm -hmm. their lives. And then those people would start their own studios and start training people. And that has gone on for 350 or 400 years. Mm -hmm. And then all of that came to a screeching halt mm -hmm. when modernism essentially took over, uh, over the world, starting with the, the Armory Show in New York in, what was it, 1907 or 1919? I'm not sure which, what year it was. And, the, and then everybody became enamored with this idea of modernism, not understanding that even the modernists at the time were classically trained. And Picasso was classically mm -hmm. trained, but over time it was believed that you didn't need these skills to be able to do things, you just needed to go out there and, and be creative. And so we've gone through this period of time where the, the artists who understood these things were uh, chastised, they were considered to be um, not with what was going on and, and they could barely make a living and some of those artists uh, got discouraged and left, some of them became modernist and very few hung on to them and really there were threads, mere threads of just a few artists who carried it forward and thankfully because there's been 
interest while these people were still alive. We're now seeing young people like you mm -hmm. who are picking up this, this stuff that's been passed on for hundreds of years and, and was almost lost. So now you're, you're taking it up and you are one of a generation of, of people who is, is young and excited in classical painting and the old masters style. Tell me why copying old masters is important for any artist to learn. Um, whenever I, whenever that, that question gets posed to me, I always go back to a series of Chicago Institute of Art lectures given by Kenyon Cox in that he describes what he calls as the classic spirit. And he says that the classic spirit is the disinterested search perfer for perfection, is that it is the love of clearness and reasonableness and self-control. That it would have each new work and each new presentation of truth and beauty uh, remind us of the old truth and the old beauty, only colored by a different medium um, and a different angle. And it loves to seep itself in tradition, and it would add link by link to the chain of tradition, but not break the chain. So when we study the masters, and when we copy the masters, I think of it in the same way as copying music. If I wanted to learn to play the piano, I, I wouldn't just start banging on a piano until music came out, because uh, Music is organized. It's organized sound. And the same thing with our pictures. It's organized color and pigment. So in, in the same respect, why is it in the 21st century that we feel that we're doing something wrong for copying? So in, a, in essence, by copying the masters, we are learning their hand and we're learning their objectives and their aesthetics and how they handled the paint and how they handled the limitations. And by doing so, we take and we approach our own paintings, not as forgers or just copyists, but with a more sophisticated view, because with our 21st century pigments, we don't rightfully need to glaze much. The chromatic intensity in the variety of pigments, we can hit any color of nature and then some. For, for the people who might not know, tell them what glazing is. So what, what glazing is, is it's a thin, transparent veil of paint that's put over a lighter underpainting. It can be used to, um, to just change a value, the lightness or darkness of a color. It can be used to give color to a colorless subject. So you always see the Madonna painted in this vibrant ultramarine blue. Now the, the ultramarine blue that they had way back when couldn't be just put, its color is very dark, so it would be put over a thin veil of a lighter color, and that would give it its vibrancy and lightness otherwise. So the light would go through it, reflect off the lighter color, exactly. and give it that vibrancy. Exactly. So artists, um, artists, the old masters, would know that and utilize that, and that was how they deal dealt with the limitations that they had of the materials. Well, what, what I find amazing is uh, when, when I first learned to paint, I was encouraged to copy old masters. Again, not so that I could be creating forgeries, but it, you, you, would, you would learn that one little flick of the wrist or one little brush stroke would make someone look heavy or thin, mm -hmm. so, you know, tiny little things, and it's, it's so important. I, I want to drill down on Rembrandt just a little bit um, because... You've gone through this process of, of learning through what we would call the atelier system, mm -hmm. learning systems that were, were brought to you and passed on, mm -hmm. but you took it further. You started looking in, into finding what I would refer to as ancient texts or mm -hmm. things that were, were out of print, things that had to be translated. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about this journey of really trying to find out how Rembrandt painted, and, and that included going beyond what's in the current books out there on Absolutely. Rembrandt. So Absolutely. tell us about that. Uh, so I had the epiphany while trying to copy a Rembrandt that I just simply could not make my paint look like his. No matter what I did with the paint that I had, I couldn't achieve it. So it led me down into this road of making my own paint because I figured that if I want to copy a Rembrandt, if I'm being true to it, I should use the same materials or as close to the same materials as possible. So it's not a matter of if he used yellow ochre, going and getting a tube of yellow I, ochre. I, 
You absolutely, uh, with, with the best materials that you can afford, you can absolutely do a, a great copy, but there are certain textural varieties that only come from handmade paint or paint that has a slightly different particle size, which gives a thixotropic quality what, to it. Uh, what's that word? Uh, thixotropic, it means it's, it's, it's almost like if you were to take uh, cornstarch and water and mix it together. When you try to move it, it stands up and it resists you and it's stiff, but if you gently agitate it, it buckles and it just gives way and becomes extremely fluid. So for, for the benefit of people who might be watching this, they might not know how paint is made. Mm -hmm. um, paint is essentially ground rock or ground, mineral or... Ground dirt or a synthetically made uh, uh, chemical. So uh, in its simplest form, we, we, let's, let's take yellow ochre for example. Um, I think we've all driven on the highway or taken a walk and said, that's some beautiful yellow dirt that I see. There are some beautiful red dirt. Uh, th that's just all iron oxide or rust stained clay. And that's the exact pigment, that's the exact color that the old masters would have used, hence the name earth colors. So you take that, you grind it up, you wash it, and then you mull it. And what you do is you take... What does mull it mean? Uh, by mullet, what I mean is we take a bit of linseed oil or walnut oil and we mix it together with that finely ground dirt. And then what we do is we take a, a large flat surface that is relatively heavy, that can be granite or glass, and we apply pressure to the paint and we try to spread that paint or pigment as thin as possible to ensure that the linseed oil or walnut oil surrounds each pigment particle thus making oil paint. So that's what you call a, a Mueller or molar, mm -hmm. and that's basically a, a large glass instrument that, exactly. that you grind that, and the more you grind it, the thinner the particles become. Yes, especially if you apply more pressure. Now, those, those who are watching, some of them know that you can buy pigments, that you mm -hmm. can buy the colors that are already ground, mm -hmm. and then you can mix them into your oil with a Mueller, is it Mueller or molar? Uh, tomato, tomato. Yep. Okay. So, but you've done something that I've not met any artist, and I think I've met most of the artists in the world, um, and that is that you have taken it to the next level. So you wanted to be so authentic to get things so much like as they would be in Rembrandt's time. A lot of those people didn't have colorists in the 19th century, we had what were called colorist, a color man, as they often mm -hmm. times referred to them, and that would be a person who actually went out, uh, got the pigments, ground them, and so on. But you, because you wanted to be authentic, you actually went out and got rocks, mm -hmm. crushed the rocks, and then made your own pigments. Yeah. Tell me about that. Well, first off, I mean, as, as, you've, as we get to know each other, you, you'll, you'll realize I'm terribly obsessive when it comes to all things painting, so. Yeah. Um, You're a painting nerd. Uh, yeah, I know, you, you got me. <laughs> this, is my, this, is my, what, this is my life to live, and I'm going to live it the best I can. Um, so it, it actually started with lead tin yellow, which was what the... Uh, which was what I needed for the Rembrandt painting. Um, so what, what lead tin yellow is, is it's a mixture of uh, a lead and tin, obviously, and it's heated to about uh, 500 to 600 degrees for hours on end. And at the time, I didn't have much, much money to, to pay for these things. And uh, in my small a Boston, uh, home, this is terrible by the way, um, I got a, a jewelry, a jewelry kiln that its max temperature was the temperature that it would need. So I, I, I acquired the, the chemicals, the, the lead oxide and the uh, tin, and I mixed them together with a bit of flux which will lower uh, the melting temperature of them. And I took an extension cord, took it outside, I plugged in the jewelry kiln with my little crucible, and I successfully made lead tin yellow. And that was the very first spark that made me say, if I can make this one, this one's a lot harder than crushing a rock. 
Um, so I just started to uh, acquire lapis from Afghanistan, ochre from Morocco or Cyprus, and crush it up in a mortar and pestle and wash and levigate the pigment. Now, levigating a pigment is uh, you wash it and then you pour off uh, the excess. And because the largest particles will sink fast in the water, the ones that are smaller will still stay suspended in the water. So you, in, in effect, can uh, get smaller homogeneous particle size just by levigating the pigment. And then you can continue to grind the colors down more and more as you see fit. But, you know, after that, I mean, it just one thing led to another. And uh, we were talking earlier about uh, Rembrandt and some of the old treaties. Uh, at a certain point, uh, Google could only tell me so much and I could only find so much at Barnes and Noble. I started looking towards the older treaties, uh, 16th, 17th, 18th century treaties that chemist color man um, had written just on uh, the colors on how to process them and what some of the pros and cons of each color were. Is earlier we were talking about um, simplifying the Rembrandt's process. And one of my favorite quotes that I stumbled across in a 15th century treaty on the craft of painting is that the craft of painting is comprised of three parts. The first part is practical. And in that practical, practical part, that's where all of our techniques, our underpaintings, our glazing, how to apply the paint lives. Right. The second part is theoretical, where uh, to create our pictures ex in a representational way, it's governed by laws, laws of proportion that the exterior contour before must be convex, it must never be concave, uh, values, colors, harmony, that stuff. And the last part is um, scientific. And that's where the whole craft of making paint and studying those particles of paint and creating the actual pigment lives. Now, in the 21st century, we don't have to deal with um, incompat incompatibility with pigments. The old masters, they did. They would use colors that would blacken within a year. Uh, even genuine vermilion will blacken if it comes into contact with any chlorine. And we sweat sodium chloride. So uh, some of the darkening in red painting and, and paintings where there's vermilion red are actually caused from, uh, they would say, gallery dust landing on an unvarnished picture and then it would blacken. So artists back then knew about the scientific part, what pigments were compatible with each other. Because certain pigments, when you mix them to, on their own, there's nothing wrong with them and the pigment will be very permanent. But if you dare mix it with something else, it becomes incredibly fugitive. A chemical reaction takes place, or it may decrease the light fastness of it. Um, for, for those of you who paint, uh, I think we've all seen uh, in the art store that there's alizarin, and then there's alizarin permanent. Right. And the, the permanent is because it's more light fast. Uh, back in Rembrandt's time, and even the alizarin that we have right now, um, the less permanent one. It's not, it doesn't have a great light fastness. Now, if we were to use that color, even genuine rose matter, uh, in a thin glaze with nothing mixed into it, the color will survive pretty well. But if we put white, white paint in there, or white pigment in there, what happens is a white pigment refracts so much light that it amplifies the amount of light that has to travel through the alizarin, which thus decreases the light fastness of the alizarin or the rose matter. Uh, a perfect 17th century example is look at the rosy red cheeks on a Rembrandt compared to the red cheeks or nose on a Franz Hals. Right. You'll always notice Franz Hals are going to be more gray and digi and washed out. And I absolutely think that when it was first painted, it was beautiful and lush and vibrant. But Franz Hals, the, the drunk that he was, I don't think he cared much at all about mixing white into the rose matter. But Rembrandt, on the other case, he always used the rose matter in the final layers. Well, the thing I noticed, uh, we painted a model together last night, and, and you used about 30 different brushes, and you were very careful 
not to over mix, that you were careful not to put certain pigments together, which mm -hmm. I've really not seen too many artists do, and you keep certain brushes for certain mixtures. Do you want to tell me about that and how that relates to what you were just saying? No, ab absolutely, absolutely. So because uh, when you work with a limited palette, uh, especially if that limited palette is very low chroma or the intensity of the color is low, it's very easy to make mud and just make, make just muck where everything looks like a gray or brown mess. So uh, in effect, if a, if a brush is uh, established for a red and a white, that brush is kept as a red and a white. That way, whenever I put that down, it will be the purest color it possibly can be. Because if you mix all of your colors together, you create a gray or a gray brown and that can be undesirable for the rosy red cheek uh, or anything anything else where you really want a clean vibrant beautiful color so for my mixtures i'll use a million and one brushes and i used to be the person that had two brushes and i would do the entire painting and continue to wipe it off but uh, the more that i studied the masters and the more that i limited the amount of colors that I had, especially when they're less strong, I realized that if I only have two brushes, it all looks gray and it all looks lifeless. So that's one of the things that led me to having many, many, many brushes because when I studied the analysis of brush marks on a Rembrandt, it's rare to find more than two pigments with white being the third in any brush mark that he made. So, if I only have two brushes, how can I keep that true? Right. And um, so, just more brushes means cleaner color. So let's talk about white. Uh, Rembrandt used lead. Mm -hmm. uh, lead is uh, considered to be highly toxic. Yes. Uh, there's two different kinds of lead, from my understanding. There's stack lead, mm -hmm. and then there's the, the traditional flake flake white, right? Mm -hmm. um, you make your own stack lead. Yeah. Tell me why you use lead when it's such a highly toxic um, paint mm -hmm. and, and how you keep from being damaged from it. That's number one. And then number two, tell me about some of the interesting things you were telling me about how Rembrandt used whites and, and, and how those whites change just, for instance, overnight. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, the, the two types of lead white that we have is uh, modern made uh, basic lead carbon or just lead white, and then there's stack lead white. And uh, the main difference between the two is the stack lead white is, um, it has a larger particle size and it's a little bit more varied. How do I keep from having lead toxicity or lead poisoning? So our skin is a wonderful barrier that keeps bacteria and viruses and everything else. You don't get the flu because somebody has touched you on the hand. So a part of pigment particle size is insoluble. So it's not like mineral spirits or turpentine that can be absorbed through your skin. So, so long as I'm not uh, painting with lead white and then eating a sandwich or putting my brushes in my mouth, I've got no lead exposure. As a paint maker, I do have the risk of inhalation of the dry pigment, but that's why you have things like fume hoods, lead respirators, gloves, and a whole bodysuit that I don't take it home to the family. So since I'm not eating, eating it, ingesting it at all, I'm at no risk for any uh, lead exposure yeah, at but all. you would be if you sanded that paint oh you, yes you but that that's that's in there with inhalation so i would never recommend sanding anything that's lead in your studio in your home because that is that absolutely will give you tons and tons of exposure yeah now in in terms of the the reason you like to use a lead white and, and specifically a stack lead white. Mm -hmm. Stack lead white, you, you have to go through this pretty difficult process to make that paint. Why do you use it? How do you make it? So the way that stack lead white is made is it's a, it's a 
It's a lead coil. So in the 17th century, and the old masters would have been very familiar with lead. They would have been used for drinking vessels and all sorts of other things. So that lead is then pounded and made into a thin sheet. That sheet is rolled up and put into a jar of sorts. Um, in Rembrandt's time, it would have been an earthenware jar or a terracotta pot. That lead is pretty frail. It's susceptible to chemical reaction like rust um, accumulates on iron rather easily. The same thing with lead. So that lead is exposed to a harsh environment of two parts, an acidic environment, which what you do is you take the lead coil and you put it in a jar, and at the bottom of the jar, you put a strong vinegar. In Rembrandt's time, that would have been simply spoiled wine. You cover that up, and then you surround it with some other material that will provide a lot of carbon dioxide, because lead white is basic lead carbonate. So it's a lead carbonate pigment, so what you need to do is turn that pure lead into that lead carbonate. But you can't go from lead to car lead carbonate. You have to go from lead to lead acetate to lead carbonate. So that's the benefit of the, um, the acid or the vinegar. Always... Now, didn't they use horse urine or something like that? The, uh, the, the carbonate part that I'm getting to is what they would do is they would take that jar and they would surround it with horse manure, but never pig, because pigs will eat anything and they have a, a lot of sulfur, and, <laughs> and that will make the lead black for, I can go on years and years about the chemistry of it, but with horse manure, as that horse manure decays, it releases a lot of carbon dioxide. I make, I make my stack lead at home, and I do not like going out to find horse manure, so I simply use a mixture of sugar and yeast. And the sugar and yeast will provide a clean source of carbon dioxide. And I keep the lead coils in this environment for about three months. And at the end of it, it, it looks like a flaky white mass that you can just crumble with your hands. And then you just scrape it off of the, off of the lead? The lead is gone. Oh, the lead, the is, lead completely, is completely so every, gone. That, that piece is completely converted to what yes. would be pigment. Yep, yep, absolutely. And, and then, then, then and it's just washed, ground, and made into paint. So what is it about lead that is so wonderful to paint with? So there's two reasons that make lead wonderful to work with. The first reason is its transparency. So if we're to compare lead white to titanium white, um, those of us who paint know that titanium white is very strong tinting, has a very strong tinting strength. So it makes colors look chalky, and that's because titanium white is very opaque. Lead white is more transparent, which means it, in admixtures, it plays better. It, it keeps our colors vibrant, lush, and beautiful. And that's really beneficial to any painter, to not make our colors drab and lifeless. The second reason is its physical characteristics. So stack lead white, having that varied particle size, has that thixotropic quality to it. Now, when you agitate it, it gives way and it loosens up. But it also holds on to itself, and it has this wonderful ropey quality to it. So Rembrandt, in his older years, you look at the whites and, and the highlights, and they're, they're thick and caked on, mm -hmm. and they have, you can tell they have a lot of body to them. Yep. Is that essentially what he was doing? Absolutely. I mean, there, there are certain additions like um, silica, ground glass, or uh, chalk that could have been put into the paint to beef it up and to increase its transparency. But for the most part, uh, it would have been primarily made out of lead white. Lead white, when you make it at the very first moment, will stand up and it will be stiffer. If you make any paint and you let it sit for a time, the, the pigment will actually absorb that oil more and the paint will increase in its amount of fluidity. So looking at some Rembrandts up close, you can see that there's moments where the brush strokes are stiff and they stand up. And then there's a moment where 
it seems that the paint just dissolves away and becomes extremely fluid. And many people have looked at Rembrandt's over hundreds of years trying to decipher how Rembrandt was able to achieve that. And from a personal standpoint, I, I think that the paint does not lie. And with enough experience making paint every day for years on end, you get to get a better idea of what the working methods were of the old masters who had an apprentice or personally had to do that themselves. Well, that's, that's fascinating. So what have you learned about Rembrandt the man? You've copied his paintings hundreds of times. You have, you've studied his students. You've studied so much about the technique. Is there anything that you think that you've picked up about Rembrandt that you think would be especially important to share? Uh, technique in uh, pers personal life wise or? Uh, Just a anything that maybe you were surprised by as you were doing your research. Um, <laughs> this is going to be a funny thing, but uh, don't overspend and uh, don't take on more students than you can take, otherwise you'll wind up bankrupt. <laughs> um, patience. Patience, patience, patience. Rembrandt was incredibly patient and he labored and he loved the surface of his painting. And uh, to his own um, status detriment. So when in the 17th century when artists were uh, f generations were growing up and the uh, fashion started to become more French and very tight. Rembrandt did the exact opposite and he got more loose and he slacked on more and more paint and he labored over the surface quality of his pictures uh, to some of the detriment of his patrons not being happy when their paintings take years on end to complete. But Rembrandt knew that the physical quality of the surface can better convince the illusion of space and light or roughness of the form better than any literal rendering. And I think that is by far my, uh, my biggest lesson to learn from Rembrandt is patience and do what is right for the pitcher to best communicate your intention. Now, he was very prolific. Absolutely. And, and yet, do you, do you think that he painted slowly? Or do you think that these, these paintings took years and months? Or did, because you, you said something to me when we talked about uh, his later years that you felt like he became a pretty fast painter. Did I get that wrong? Um, I think he became more proficient with painting and he was able to be more direct. But with that directness comes high scrutiny and him wanting a not being okay with something that is wrong. So he would actually scrape and remove layers and he wouldn't let them out of the door until they were just right. So on one hand, he's more proficient and he can do things more direct. But on the other, he's experimenting and he's delving into uncharted territory for painting in the 17th century. So um, it, it, in, a, in effect, I think that he actually became slower mm. as, he, as he aged because he was after higher, uh, higher goals than just making the person look like the person. It was a fully handmade picture that every mark was thought out, planned out from the very beginning. So not everybody watching this is going to want to paint Rembrandt paintings, but what is it that they're going to learn from understanding how Rembrandt worked in that time that can translate to them in modern times? A logical working order. Remember what I said earlier that painting is practical and if you have a logical working order in the way that you paint that can significantly speed up your process and uh, Cure, your, cure yourself of any doubt or frustration along the way if you know 
what you're obligated to do or inclined to do at every single stage. Okay, excellent. Well, this has been fascinating. I, I think uh, you, you and I went plein air painting together mm -hmm. for a day we uh, spent four or five hours yeah. in the car together. In blue bonnets. And, uh, uh, you know, this is an endless conversation. You are fascinating. You have a, a you. tremendous amount of knowledge. And you've accomplished so much at this stage of your life. It's going to be really fun to watch your career and, and how you soar taking these techniques and taking it all to the next level. Because we talked about how... Uh, what Rembrandt would have done if he were alive today, knowing what he knew, knowing the limitations of his materials then, and then how, by, by having the modern materials today, how it would change things. Do you want to touch on that at all? So I, I think that it, it's, it's, it's somewhat hard to say because I don't know how Rembrandt would feel. I don't know if he would look at the colors that we have today and the materials that we have today, and I don't know if he would be thrilled or appalled. Right. <laughs> He'd be, put, put yellow oak or vermilion red or uh, any dirty color. Rembrandt used black for his blue. So put that next to a phalo blue, and I don't, I don't think Rembrandt would know what to do with it. But having the resources, having the, the ease of working and the consistency, I think that the work that he would have done would have been even more prolific. The amount, uh, we, we are able to acquire 17th century treaties, 16th century treaties. We're able to read uh, Pliny, which is a, an ancient form of an encyclopedia, right on our phones. So I think that Rembrandt would have would have been thrilled to know how much information he could acquire because just looking at all of the things that he collected, the curiosities, he was a very intellectual person. In regards to materials, I'm not sure how he would feel if he were able to have every array of brush and every pigment and color that he could possibly imagine but I think he would be thrilled at the consistency and the amount of information that he could acquire. One thing I noticed is that you are actually using some brushes that are very old, mm -hmm. that, that were made out of goose. A goose feather ferrule. Yeah. They're wire-tied brushes with a goose feather holding together uh, the hairs. And is that what Rembrandt would have used? Yep, yep. So at that time, remember that the 17th century painters only had round brushes. So typically the brushes were wire tied. So the, the boar or hog bristle uh, hairs or that of a sable or squirrel would have been bunched together and twisted and made into just the right shape uh, to which wire would have been or wire or waxed thread or string would have been used to tie them together. Following that, a big hefty brush would have just put, been put right onto a handle or stick paintbrush handle. The uh, smaller sable brushes would have been uh, stuck into the uh, a a goose feather, a goose feather that has been cut like a quill, and that would have been adhered in there with a bit of rabbit skin glue, and that would have held it together. And then that would be situated onto just the right size of a brush, but that could be taken off and um, that could be removed and put onto different handles at their leisure. So somebody who's watching this wants to paint uh, a, a Rembrandt copy or an old master copy, they don't have to go through all this. No, 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 no. Like I said, I'm just terribly obsessive. Yeah, you're, you, you want to be... I want to be as close. I want to be as close to that time as possible. That way I can make as educated of a decision on my observations because I can only make so educated a decision on the observations of just reading and just looking at the pictures. But if I haven't experienced it, I, I feel like I can't make as good of a decision. But th that's not necessary. You know. But all that information is there if you want it and you, wanna, yes. you really want to take it to, the, to the highly advanced level. Let's talk about outdoor painting. Uh, Rembrandt did some incredible landscapes. Mm -hmm. 
Um, do you think that he did anything on location? Was it merely sketching? Do you think that he actually took some ground pigments with him and painted on location? Do you have any sense of that? I think the high majority of them would have been done in the studio. So he every day would go out and draw, or do, do an etching or, or do a drawing of, of ink or with graphite or metal point, lead point. Um, his, his paintings out of doors do not, they're, they're created, they are thought out pictures. The light effect in them is not natural the way we see light out of doors. So I think that he compiled a lot of his information from his sketches into his paintings for um, uh, landscape pictures. And you, t you said to me that he would lay down lead white in his skies, mm -hmm. I think initially, to mm -hmm. make sure that his skies were vibrant. Vibrant, exactly. Yeah. And to which uh, he would then cover with um, uh, the best blue pigment that he had available to him. So uh, a lot of artists at that time, um, uh, ones that had wealthy enough patrons, would use genuine ultramarine, which as we all know is a vibrant, beautiful color. But still today, it's worth close to its weight in gold. And I don't foresee Rembrandt using uh, much of genuine ultramarine on just a landscape. So he would use uh, other colors that were slightly transparent but had a nice vibrant blueness to them. One of them being uh, cobalt doped glass or smalt. So that's just like the blue glass that we have in a bottle. And that, was, uh, that blue frit was ground up into a very coarse particle size. Uh, the same thing with azurite, which is a copper-based copper silicate pigment that has the same type of blueness. But Rembrandt would have known that that would green over time. So if, if you see a Rembrandt sky and it looks a little bit green, that could be attributed to the azurite turning or the oil yellowing over right, time. Right. But, uh, Artists at that time knew the limitations of their paint and would make concessions to make their chroma of their colors more vibrant by having those brighter underpaintings. Great. Well, Eric, this has been fascinating. Thank, Thank you, you so much for, Thank for being on. Pleasure. Uh, my name's Eric Rhodes, and you've been watching Interviews with the Artist. And thanks again to Eric Johnson. And we're going to be watching you and watching what you're doing with your career, but your work is blowing me away looking at the Rembrandt study that I just saw you paint uh, and, and seeing the original, having seen the original, I can't tell a difference. Thank you. So no forging now. No, no forging. forging. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you everyone for, for watching. That was Eric Johnson and Rembrandt Secrets Revealed. You can learn more about that at Lily Art Video. Dot com. Thanks for watching today. I'm Eric Rhodes. Rembrandt. Considered one of the greatest artists in history and known for his lifelike and expressive portraits. Rembrandt created mood with dramatic light, thick paint, and thin glazes. This year, the world is celebrating the Year of Rembrandt, marking the 350th anniversary of this great master's death. And yet, artists around the world are still studying his work to inform their own, trying to understand his techniques to give life and drama to their own paintings. Countless numbers of artists, whether students or professionals, have copied Rembrandt's work in order to better understand how and why his work is so historically significant. Yet few ever really figured it out because of his unique layering approach, which made him the master's master. In honor of the year of Rembrandt, and because so many artists want to understand Rembrandt more, in conjunction with Fine Art Connoisseur magazine, we began a worldwide search to find the one artist most capable of understanding and teaching Rembrandt's work at the highest level. That extensive search of the world's best Rembrandt copyists led us to an artist who has not only mastered the art of creating Rembrandt-style paintings in his own work, 
He has scoured ancient texts in foreign languages in order to understand every small detail. From how Rembrandt created his paint, how he prepared his canvas, how he layered paint, even how he used a simple technique to rough in the first layer without requiring a lot of drawing skill. Our search led us to a young artist who has spent the last decade obsessing about Rembrandt. And once you see him paint or listen to him talk, you'll instantly understand why we chose him over hundreds of other artists to be your teacher. One of the things that you'll find about Rembrandt is he and all of his other Dutch contemporaries had a very systematic way of working, a very logical order of painting that ensures a success at the end of every work. In Rembrandt's Secrets Revealed, artist Eric Johnson is going to show you everything that Rembrandt did that, without knowing it, would make him a timeless legend. You're going to see it all as Eric demonstrates a complete start-to-finish Rembrandt painting titled Self-Portrait at Age 23. And if you compare the original side-by-side, -side, it's amazingly accurate. You can observe and practice each and every step so you can create your own Rembrandt paintings. Also, you can give your paintings drama by employing Rembrandt's techniques. Seven full hours of detailed instruction that is easily understood by beginners and pros alike. All throughout the film, Eric includes information on the paint and materials used during Rembrandt's time period and suggests modern alternatives. You'll also hear many historical painting facts and tips that will help deepen and enrich your knowledge. You'll treasure this video because of the knowledge and skills you'll develop to increase your significance as an artist. Available on DVD or digitally to view on your computer, tablet or smartphone. In celebration of the official year of Rembrandt. Rembrandt Secrets Revealed with Eric Johnson. Order yours today.